For his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Praise God.
this morning, and you are going to be glad you tuned in. We have a powerful message this morning from God, and I want to tell you, I need you to start a watch party. I need you to hit somebody up. I need you to share with somebody that we are on, because I really believe prophetically that there is a word for someone who is going through a trial or a struggle this morning, or someone just needs to reinforce who they are in God, because this word today is going to help firm up your foundation in God. So, uh, I've been moved to pray, and uh, I'd like you to join me in a word of prayer. Then we're going right into the word of God. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Father God, I thank you this morning for your sovereign will. I thank you for how you have woke us up today. And gave us a brand new start and a brand new chance. Every day in you is a brand new, fresh start. Oh, somebody needs to hear that. God, I ask that you not let me mess up this word, but allow this word to go forward and accomplish what you have sent it to do. I decrease and allow you to increase. Come now, Holy Spirit, and preach. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, go with me to the New Testament book of Colossians. And it's very simple because we're going to chapter 1 in the book of Colossians. Chapter 1, Colossians. When you have it, just say amen, and I will pick up on your amen. All right, we're going to begin reading at verse 9, and I'll read maybe... Nine verses, or somewhere around there. Just I'm going to follow the Spirit of God today. Verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. That you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all might, according to the glorious might, that you might have great endurance and patience. Verse 12, And giving joyful thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of His holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. For as long as the Spirit of the Lord would allow, we're going to speak from this thought. You have to go higher. That's right. Let's do it again. You have to go higher. Let's talk about it. Every book in the Bible has a theme that explains the purpose for which the book was written. Every New Testament book. Every book in the Bible, not just the New Testament. And this book of Colossians has one of the most powerful themes in Scripture because when Paul writes this letter, he talks about the preeminence of Christ and the sufficiency of of Christ. He says that Christ is all sufficient for everything. You don't need anything else. He is the author of our redemption. He is the winner of our salvation. And he is the one that we owe our life to. The preeminence of God. So the book of Colossians was written in AD 60 or 61 when Paul was sitting in a Roman jail. This was one of his prison Epistles. Paul penned this letter to the church, a church that he had never been to, a church that he didn't start. But he penned this letter to the church because of a visit from Epaphras, one of his converts from his two years when he was in Ephesus, who was now the leading pastor of the church in, in Colossae. And Epaphras came to Rome, where Paul was in prison, to minister to Paul, but also to bring him a message about this church. 
And, Paul, and he brought Paul an exciting message. He said, the church at Colossae, the Colossians, are convicted. They are faithful. They understand the word. They're sold out to God. And, and Paul even used some of that language in the first chapter. He said, we heard about your love for God and your love for the brethren and how you have a hope for God in heaven. And he talked about all the good things that was going on in Colossae. But then this letter was sent because Paul said, with all of this, you still can't stay where you are. I know you're excited about God. I know you're excited about your place in the Lord. But God never meant for you to stay in that place. You have to go higher or you won't survive. Why would Paul pin that letter after hearing something good? Here's the rest of the story. It's because Epaphras also said that the Colossians church was being preached a lot of Heresy, Christological heresy, a lot of false doctrine about the fact that Jesus Christ might not even have been divine. They were preaching and they were struggling, they were wavering, they were faithful, but they were listening to this and they were struggling and Paul had to write to them to try to prop them up. He wanted them to know, even though you're excited about God, even though you're working hard for God, if you don't live your life trying to get higher, trying to get closer, trying to build a deeper purpose in God, sooner or later, the enemy or somebody's going to knock your feet from under you. Come on, that's the warning, that's the message that this text is saying to us today, that no matter how well you are situated in God right now, it's not going to help you when the next battle comes along. God has set us up so that we are always constantly going higher in God. We are supposed to be seeking more of God, trying to get closer to God, trying to understand the mysteries of God, trying to be excited about God every day because there's so much to learn about God. And yet we get comfortable sometimes. And when we get comfortable, we forget that that's when we set ourselves up for failure or for struggle or defeat or for loss. Now, let me, let me illustrate this to you right now, because there's something fresh on my mind, and I know everybody out there will understand this. I am a sports fan, and I am so glad that professional sports are back. I'm so glad. I mean, I like football. I like basketball. I like all sports, but all sports, but football and basketball are the two sports that I like, and I am so glad they're back. Go Eagles. I just stuck that in, and I know, I know who they are, and also my basketball team uh, is... Uh, well, my basketball team is Philadelphia Sixers, but right now I'm also a LeBron James fan. That's what's relevant to this story, so stay with me. Because when basketball season started, that was the first sport to figure out how to continue to play games even in the pandemic. What they did is they came up with a bubble that was sanitized, and all the players had to live and play in this bubble down in Florida. It was smart. They brought all the players in, told them you can't go out while you're playing games. If you leave, you're going to have to quarantine. And then when you come back, your team will not have you for a while. So they had to stay in there and play, and it was working. All the teams, I don't think they had one. Uh, some players couldn't get there at first, but I think everybody made it through in that bubble. I watched closely. And so the two teams they picked to win, even before the pandemic, were the Los Angeles Lakers and the Los Angeles Clippers. They said they will be in the finals, Clippers and the Lakers. Well, uh, matter of fact, they said the Clippers, everybody who was in the know, would beat the Lakers. They, they just, and, and why they went that way is because last June, as the season was starting, they were able to obtain the Clippers uh, fresh off his world championship MVP season, Kawhi Leonard. And when they got Kawhi Leonard, they said, oh, the Clippers are that much more better. And then they went out and acquired or traded for one of the all-star, full-time all-star shooting forwards, big guards, Paul George. So they were set. But here is the problem. They bought into it. Everybody started drinking the Kool-Aid. Everybody said they're going to win. They start talking about how good they were. And from the press conference on, this is the team. Everybody said that even the Lakers don't stand a chance because of the bench play of the Clippers. I got to get at it because I'm talking too much sports. But what happened is Doc Rivers, the Hall of Fame coach, even bought into it. You know what Doc did? He started load management even after they got back to the bowl. Now, load management is when you sit down your stars during regular season games that you still don't mean much. But other teams were out there hungry. Other teams were out there working. 
Other teams were out there pushing to get better. And the team that they ran into after the Clippers beat round one, the team they ran into was the Denver Nuggets. And the Denver Nuggets was a hungry team. They were a team that was sharpening their skills. And to make a long story short, they beat the Clippers. It was a shock. It was considered one of the most one of the most terrible losses in professional basketball. And you know why it was considered a loss? Because they were walking around thinking they had it made, teasing other teams. Everybody said, how in the world could they lose? They were entitled. They felt like they should win. But when it was all said and done, the Denver Nuggets came back from uh, three double-digit deficits in some games to beat them, and they embarrassed them. And what happened? I'll tell you what happened. The Clippers started believing they could win because they had the pieces, not because they were trying to get better. They believed because of who they were that they could, they could win. And because they believed that, they lost. That's what God is saying to us. Some of y'all can sing. Some of y'all shout. Some of y'all can tell me how long you've been saved. Some of you can tell me I can pray with the best of them. I felt the Holy Spirit moving in my body. I know what God can do. You can tell me all that. But if you don't continue to try to go higher in the Lord, you won't be ready for the next battle coming at you. Listen to me. Too many battles are coming. Somebody's sitting there now. The only reason you lost is because you were sitting there resting on and relying on the last time you prayed, the last time you spoke in tongues. The last time you praised God and you said, I know I can handle this. And the enemy snuck in there. And at the end of that season, everybody said the Clippers were anemic. They were, they had no endurance. Those are the words I'm talking about. You can get anemic. You can have no endurance because you're not every day getting up trying to get better in God. Trying to go higher in the Lord. Old folks used to say, let's go higher higher in the Lord. But now we have this sentiment of all this name and claim it. And I know some scriptures and I know some formulas and the devil is on us. The enemy's on us and we lose because we're not trying to go higher. Come on, tell somebody, you need to go higher in the Lord. As a matter of fact, if you look at the Bible, we are commanded by God to go higher. Write the scripture down. We are commanded by God to go higher. The first thing we have to understand is we're commanded to grow. First Peter 2 and 2 says, As newborn babes desire the, the milk of the word, the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. As newborn babes, First Peter 2 and 2, desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. God is saying when you get saved, you ought to automatically grow like a baby going after milk. You ought to be going after the Word. And you know what gets me is sometimes when we first get saved, we are so hungry for the Word, and then we start laxing as we go through. Because the Bible also says when it comes to growth, you can't stay there. You can't keep drinking milk your whole life. That's why Paul told the church at Hebrews, he told the Hebrews in Hebrews 5, Verse 14, he said, um, strong meat belong to those who are of full age. Watch the terminology. Who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern between good and evil. Listen to the text. It says that strong meat or meat, after you get off the milk, you got to eat meat. But the only way you can eat that meat is if you have grown up, you're of full age, so that you got your senses exercised by the trials you've been through, by the struggles you overcame, by the battles that you've been fighting. You got your senses able to tell you that I can handle this evil and this is the good that God's going to do. So when God says growth, he said, get some milk. But then he said, there ought to be a time when you're eating meat. Not only that, did God say you ought to uh, be able to grow or you ought to keep going higher because of growth? You ought to go higher because now you are a spiritual being. Oh, watch this text. You were living your whole life in your flesh. And now all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. You start hearing spiritual language. You, you start being in church where the anointing of God is flowing, where you start seeing things and, and people making uh, 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 confessions and God's Spirit moving through the congregation. How in the world are you going to stay like you are with all that spiritual activity going on? You cannot. That's why you got to go to 1 Peter 4, verse 12 and 13. 1 Peter 4 says, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that should try you, 
as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. And when his glory is revealed, you will be revealed also in him. Watch this. You can't handle spiritual things in a natural body. You are spirit, soul, and body. You got to now know that that text has told you that you got to think it not strange when you have a fiery trial. The world tells you one thing, God says another thing. When the spirit got in you, you got to answer the trial by your spirit, not by your flesh. Man, I mean, I can tell you some crazy things that have happened to me spiritually, but I no longer think they're crazy. The main part of that text, you know what he said? He said, think he said, but rejoice when you're suffering. Rejoice? Yeah, because those of us who are spiritual have learned every time I suffer, it's a time to rejoice because God's going to show up. How many know every time I suffer, God has always been there? Every time I suffer, God has shown me how to get stronger. As a matter of fact, the times that I suffer are the times that I got stronger. The times that I suffer are the times when I could look out and see that my God was on the job. All I'm saying to you is when you get spiritual, you won't fall apart every time something happens to you because you'll know how to get on your knees and pray. You'll know how to trust God when stuff comes. You'll know how to bless God when things come. So God said, you got to grow. you got to understand that you are spirit now. And here's the worst one of all. I, I couldn't believe this one when I, when, I, when I was writing this message. God said, I need you to throw this in there. There's a lot of reasons why you should go higher. But here's one God wants you to know. Job 1 and 8. Watch this. The last reason you should always be striving to go higher is because God is going to test your faith. You don't believe me? Listen to the text. Job 1 and 8. So the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, who is an upright man, full of the Spirit, hates evil? Wait a minute. When I read that, I said, God, you must got this backwards. How are you recommending me to be tested by the devil when you just said I'm good, I'm upright? Because God said, I got to test your faith so you'll want to go higher. I test you to build my kingdom, but I test you so you can grow and know who you really are. That blew me away. That I got to keep going higher because every now and then, if I stay where I am, God's going to give me a test and I'm not ready. You realize some of the stuff you blamed on the devil could have been God testing you. And because you stopped reading, you stopped praying, you stopped trusting. You thought it was the devil, and it was God saying you should have been ready. So let's look at this text. Look what Paul wrote. That's why I said this is so powerful. Paul wrote to this Colossian church. They were giving them all kind of accolades. But Paul wrote to them, and, and you know what I always say? I like to tell you where I'm going, so, so please understand this. This is what I got out of those verses. We're only going to look at the first chapter, verses 1 through 18, but I need you to understand what God spoke to me through those verses. Here's what he said. First of all, you have to walk worthy to go higher. You have to learn how to walk worthy. Be proud. Make your Christian faith your all in all. You got to walk worthy of God. Never be ashamed anywhere of the Lord. Secondly, you got to learn how to worship from your heart to go higher. I'm emphasizing worshiping from your heart because not worship, because sometimes our worship is predicated on a breakthrough. Our worship comes along because we just heard something good. God said, no, a true worshiper worships God in darkness, in light, in hell, high water, all the time. Because that kind of worship is not driven by circumstances around me. It's driven by my heart for God. My heart for God says, no matter what my condition, keep praising my Savior. How many of y'all know a praise will break out on you, even when you're going through the worst situation? You ever had yourself... Going down, I mean, you were really under it, and all of a sudden you start worshiping or singing a worship song. Somebody needs to sing a worship song right now, because what God is saying is, it is those people who worship from their heart that get blessed. I went too far. I know. Watch this. So you got to learn to walk worthy to go higher. You got to worship from your heart to go higher. Then the last thing he told them is why they have a right to go higher. Why you have a right to go higher. Let's talk about it. I already told you that Epaphras came to Paul, can you see, in prison. And when Epaphras came to Paul in prison, he was 
under the impression that he was, Paul was under the impression that he was just going to minister to Paul. But he didn't come just to minister to Paul. He came to tell him about the trouble that the Colossians were going through and that it was getting worse. So Paul started out this first chapter with two prayers. One prayer covers verses 1 through 7, which is a prayer of thanksgiving. You can read the words there that, that Paul was reading. Uh, Paul, by the uh, faith in God to the saints and faithful brethren, which is a colossy, grace be to you. Verse 3, we give thanks to God, starts the prayer. Then he thanks God for all the good things they have been going through. Already told you that. But then after that, verse 8, he settles that and said, we also declare your love of the Spirit. But then there is a turn. There is a switching. Paul said, but I got to tell you, with the stuff you're going through now, with all this heresy, with all this doctrine about other gods, with all this trouble you're facing, you're not going to face it unless you go higher. So for this cause, then he starts another prayer that leads to some instructions on how to go higher. He said, for this cause, since the day we heard it, we hope that you will be filled with all wisdom and the will of God. Uh, that you be filled with the wisdom and the will of God and spiritual understanding. Let's talk about it. So the first thing he said that you need in order to walk worthy is to know God's will for your life. Now, I need to share with you, we've always talked about God and God's will as if it's hidden, uh, you know, as if God is trying to hide his will from us. You know, when I was growing up as a younger Christian, you know, I bought into that lie. You know, what is God's will for my life? I was looking for something, you know, to come down from heaven. We were looking for all kind of signs. Come on, if you didn't grow up like I did, you be in a church and somebody lay hands on you and tell you God's will. All of that's good. But I need you to know three things about God's will. It's not a mystery. He's not trying to hide it. It's right in front of you. Because the first thing you need to understand about God's will, Psalms 119, 105. Psalms 119, 105. God's will is his word. Settle. Right there. So I don't have to worry when the enemy comes and says, because I'm sick, I'm going to die. I don't have to worry when somebody tells me that uh, I'm not going to make it through this trial. I don't have to worry when somebody tells me you're not going to have money to pay your bill. No, 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 wait a minute. I know the word. The, the Bible just said that his will is his word because it says his word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my pathway. It's the word that leads me into God's will. All I got to do is know the word and I will know God's will. I'm helping somebody. Watch this. The will of God, when you get sick and you're sitting there wondering, crying in the middle of the night, is this going to be the end? Understand something about God's will. God's will is his word, and his word says, if there's any sick among you, call for the elders of the church, and the prayer of faith will raise them up, anoint them with oil, and they will be saved, forgiven if they have any sins. What am I saying? We have word that says, God does not desire that we walk around sick without being healed. He said, I will take sickness out of the midst of thee. Does somebody hear me? Here's what he said. You can lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Why are you laying there crying and wondering if it's God's will? Stop speaking the word over your life. Lay some hands on you and take that word of God and make a confession and his will will flood your soul. His will is his word. So you sit here in the doctor's office waiting on your diagnosis and the diagnosis does not look favorable. Or you're in the hospital waiting on an operation and you're wondering, you know, how's this going to go? Am I going to make it through? Quit doing that and rest yourself in God's will. If the doctor says no, God's will can say yes. And you got to trust God's will. If nothing is on your side, God's will is because his will is his word. So you got to trust in God's word. I am not the only one here who knows somebody that the doctor said, you got this long to live. As a matter of fact, I can think of three people within the last year that I know. One of them asked me to preach their funeral. Somebody said, you got this long to live, six months. I know some people, in reality, out of those three, somebody was told they had six months, and it's three years ago they were told that. Don't you know you got to trust God and not trust people? And when you understand God's will, you will know that I don't have to worry about what people are saying because God is the one who is the healer. How do I know his word said he healed blind Bartimaeus? He didn't do that if he didn't want us to be healed. He healed the woman with the issue of blood. He wouldn't have done that or showed us that if he didn't want us to know his will was for us to be healed. He told us what we could do. All I'm saying is 
trust in God's word because that is his will. His word says, if you confess it, it will come to pass. Oh, I need somebody to suck that in right there. If you confess it, lay down in your worst moment and just start confessing his word that it's his will. And you make sure you understand that and you will get the blessing from God. What do I mean? So the, your, your world, the world, your mind, because there's a battle going on in your mind. Your mind is telling you, I'm going crazy. Why are you confessing that? When God said, I gave you a sound mind. But, uh, the, the, your mind will say, I don't know how much longer I can handle this. Why are you confessing that when God said, my peace, I leave with you? Your body would say, man, we've fallen apart. Why are you confessing that when God is the one that says, I can restore you? Come on. you got to understand that God's will is powerful. He told the church of Colossians, when you know his will, which is his word, you don't have to worry about somebody giving you heresy. Here's the next thing about God's will. His will is always in your best interest. What I mean by that? His will is always in your best interest. Everything you have made it through, you made it through. Because of God's will. There were other folk who went through some stuff that you went through and did not make it. But it was God's will that you make it. Every bad situation that you can celebrate, God brought you through it. Every bad situation that you can think about is because up in glory, God's will was for you to not go under. Come on. There were times you thought you were going under, but God said you can't go under right now. Somebody ought to celebrate the fact that it's not my will. God's will will supersede my will. And God's will says... I'm going to make sure that you make it through that situation. Somebody here needs to understand that when we talk about we have free will, we do have free will. But some of you know with your free will, it was not your free will that got you saved. It was because God willed to take you out of that situation and got you saved because he is the one that declared you were going to be his child. You have to understand, no matter what's going on in your life, God will make sure because you belong to him, Please hear this, that everything works out for your good. That everything that happens is going to be something that blesses you because of that. Uh, I remember when I was seven or eight years old. Uh, I can't remember which, but penicillin was the miracle drug. And I remember I got a bad, you know, cold, I don't know, was flu, whatever it was. I was a child. And they took me to the hospital. I was shot with penicillin. I had a severe allergic reaction. I was put in an oxygen tent. I'll never forget now, some of the kids who were on that ward with me, they died. But I remember, I made it out of there, and I was too sick. I, I, it, it was a terrible time. I just remember I had a roommate in there, and I remember being in the hospital, sitting in that tent. I can still hear myself trying to breathe. I'm serious. But you know what? It was not God's will for me to go under. Let me tell you why. I believe that the devil, that the enemy, will try to take you out. So he'll use some circumstances to take you out. And those circumstances that he used to take you out is so you can't do what God wants you to do. What am I talking about? When I grew up in church, I was singing in church at that age. And you know how the old folk used to say, they used to prophesy over you? I'll never forget, more than once they would say, that boy is going to be a preacher. That little boy right there is going to be a preacher. I would go in church and mimic all the preachers and jumping around and singing. You know what happened? I believe the devil heard that. And when the devil heard that, come on, I'm, somebody just bright, brightened up out there. Somebody just thought about that. The devil tried to take me out so nobody would hear me preach, so nobody would get saved, so I would never grow up to be able to do what I do. Come on, I'm not talking about me trying to be so much. I'm telling you, it's in the Word of God. The Word of God said they tried to take Christ, they tried to take the Messiah out. They didn't know who it was, so they killed all the babies. I believe the devil some falls, some accidents, some struggles you've been through. That was the devil taking you out. I need you to take a praise break right here. I need you to thank God for that moment when the enemy tried to destroy you, but you're still here. I need you to thank God for that night when you should have been taken out, but God came down with some power and wrote, come on, you got back up and don't even know where your energy came from. It's because God willed you to still be alive. And not only that, I believe God's will is not only his word, not only it, it is my best interest, God's will also is the strongest force out there. God's will. The good thing about us knowing God is for us, who can be against us, is because his will can knock everything else out of my life. Oh, somebody's living off of that right now. You're living off that fact right now. Come closer, listen to me. God's will is the strongest.
strongest thing you can pray because you already know it's for your best interest. Here's what I'm talking about. I was at a, a hospital praying with a group of preachers over a good friend of ours who was on a ventilator. And as we were praying, they asked me, Pastor Douglas, will you pray? And I prayed, and I prayed God, you know, to raise him up. I prayed God to heal. But at the end of the prayer, I said, Lord, let your will be done. Oh, my God. When I got outside, I had a couple of my brethren, a couple of my uh, uh, Christian, you know, uh, fellowship folk come out there and tell me. My Pentecostal folks said, why are you praying something like that? We got to go back in and command that they get raised up. Command that they be healed. I said, I just did. I said, do you know, when I say, Lord, let your will be done, that is the strongest prayer I could pray because it's showing God I trust him. I'm not saying you don't go out there and ask specifically for what you want, but you better hear me. Don't ever think that what you want for your life is better than what God wants for your life. That's your problem. We try to control stuff. Then when we can't control it, we turn it over to God. But if you ever say, if you've got enough sense to say, Lord... I lay my hands in your will. It has nothing to do with specific prayers. It has everything to do with your faith and trust in God. And then the text tells us, not only that, he says you got to walk worthy. Verse 10, you got to walk worthy of the Lord in all pleasing. Walk worthy. Hold your head up. Be proud. Uh, uh, make sure you represent God well. Make sure you honor God in everything you do. Try to live worthy of the calling. What that? I love that text because then it says, "How do I? I got to walk worthy of something I know I'm not worthy of." Hello, come on! I'm not the only one. You know, you and I know some of the thoughts we got in the back of our minds, some of the dark stuff we did. You know some of my story, but you don't know all my story. And when you don't know my story, but God does know my story, I know that I was not worthy. But I'm glad. He decided to save me anyhow. So I walk worthy. I give him glory and honor wherever I can. I try to make sure he knows that I will give him credit. I will stick by him. I will be there. What does, what does, what does, um, uh, Sylvester Stallone, Kevin Hart, Will Smith, um, Johnny Depp, Harrison Ford, all have in common? What, what do all those stars have in common? Okay, they all got money. They're all superstars. You know, they can buy anything they want. Everybody knows them. Well, here it is. Here's what they have in common. All of them, when they got famous, left the spouse who helped get them there. They all left the person that stuck with them through thick and thin. What am I talking about? And when you read their story... You find out that it was over affairs, it was over trying to get somebody younger, it was no loyalty to the person that stuck with them through what I call the hot dogs and beans period. All I'm saying to you is, Kevin Hart, if you listen to his statement, Kevin Hart and his girlfriend Tori dropped out of college so that they could pursue a show business career. His went well. Along the way, they had two children. Hers did not go well. Once he got his breakthrough, it was nothing for him to leave his wife. I started to say baby mama, but I won't disrespect a position God has given. He left his wife and those two kids for another woman. And listen to Kevin Hart. You can read this. He said the statement itself. He said, y'all got to understand, it was during that same time that I was going through my sexy period. And I was young and had no control. All I'm saying is there was no loyalty to the person that stuck with you. How do you think God feels when you two-time him with another God? When you start acting like, uh, well, you know, I need this. Uh, or you two-time God with pity parties. Or you two-time God with, you know, with, uh, if you're a drinker, some alcohol. Or you two-time God with, I gotta have this. And God said, wait a minute. All the stuff I've done for you, all that I've brought you through. Look what he said here. He said, you gotta make sure that you walk worthy of who God is, that you stand up and learn how to please God. I don't care what anybody says. Anytime you ask me how I got where I'm at, how many know I'm going to tell them without God, I would be nothing. Without God, I would fail. Without God, my life would be lost. Is there somebody out 
there right now who shivers when you think where you will be without God. I don't understand what, man, I want to throw my hands up and say, thank you, God. Where would I be without you? But we got to learn to please God. Hebrews 11 and 6. Watch this. It says, uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who come to him. Watch all that. Here's what God is saying. There's no other way to please me but by faith. How do I honor him? Live by faith. Go through hard times, but keep my hand in his hand. Be thinking. Don't see a way out, but keep believing. My God is working on my case. Never, ever, ever show sign that you're not trusting God. Make sure you stay there because God rewards those who trust him. You got to understand that trust factor is that God is looking for somebody who will trust Him so He can bless them. What am I talking about? That um, Daniel knew that if he opened up the window and prayed, he would go in the lion's den. But he said, "I will never dishonor dishonor my God, who brought me this far by not praying in front of people." You know how some of y'all get in the restaurant. And I know, you've been saved a long time. Shame to put your hands up and pray. Do one of them quick, you know, breathe over your food stuff. And that ain't praying. Sometimes, I'm not saying you show off, but put your hands together and just give God His glory. And also, it will bless your food. <laughs> so, what you need to understand is, Daniel was rewarded by not being touched by the lion, but getting a promotion. Esther said, if I perish, let me perish. But I'm going to, God honored that faith! Saved her people and raised her up and gave her favor. God gives you favor when you stand up for him. He stands up for you. And the text tells us you got to make sure you hold on to God's hands. Then he said you got to be strengthened. I'm talking about how you walk worthy. you got to be strengthened with all might to make sure that you allow the strength of God. Verse 11, according to his glorious power. Watch this. And I'm going to shoot down to the second point. Watch this. His glorious power, you got to be strengthened with all might. A woman walked up to the famed violinist, uh, Fritz Kressler, after a concert, and she cried out, Oh! i got to make sure I get these words right so you hear. I give my life to play as well as you do. Fritz Kressler looked at her and said, I already did. Don't miss it. Here's what I'm saying. When you look at somebody who's a cancer survivor, you look at somebody who's going on dialysis every day, but they're still trusting God. When you look at somebody who is living in a, a you know, a, a, a situation that's not real good, but they're still smiling and, and full of joy. When you see somebody raising a special needs child, or you see somebody who survived their children doing drugs, or you see somebody who is fighting depression every day, but they don't fail to lift their hands and give God praise. And you look and all you see is our outward exterior. All you see is the little joy we got. All you see is the, you know, that we got a testimony and you see the consistency of our faith and you say, oh man, I want what they had. No, you don't. You don't want what I, you see, you see that outside stuff. You didn't see those nights when I was crying. You didn't see those days when I didn't think I was going to make it. You didn't see that time when I had no joy and I had to wipe tears from my eyes and fake it. You didn't see the days that the enemy was so heavy on my back. I felt like giving up. You don't say you want to be like me unless you want to know something. I had to fight for this joy. I had to fight for that night, good night sleep. As a matter of fact, I've gone through such bad times that I'd have three bad days just to get to a good day. Don't tell me. What I'm trying to tell you is you got to be strong. You got to be strengthened in your spirit. You got to let every trial strengthen you to hold on because that strength will teach you to hold on to where your strength comes from. I'm telling you all those things. I didn't do it. It was the God that stood by me at night that did it. But when you see somebody out there, you better quit, you better quit saying you want uh, uh, what I have unless you want to go through what I went through. Uh, and, and all I'm saying to you is when you see those people, understand that we have been through some struggles. One of the worst times in my life was when my father died. And I was called by my mother, but I 
didn't make it to the hospital before he died. It was a terrible time, though, because I had to still play Reverend Duncan's, and I was out doing Pastor Duncan's stuff. And by the time I got to the hospital, my father had passed. And I, I remember asking the people, can I go to the morgue? And they let me go to the morgue. And I'm just telling you, I know my folk know this story. And I got to the morgue, and when I got down there, I never forget sitting there praying, watching my father's whole body. But what ate me up was the guilt that I was out there doing all this and didn't get his last words. I didn't get a chance to say goodbye. And I'll never forget this thing haunted me through the funeral, through the next few weeks. And here's what I want to tell you about strength. I was praying and praying, and I got a breakthrough. Until you've had a day or night when God spoke to you. One night, in one of those nights when I was sleeping, God came to me and said, Your father forgives you. He understands. I remember laying in my bed crying and thanking God because that's how real this journey is. As we're striving, we got to make sure we strengthen God. All right, so let's, let's move quickly. Worship from your heart. Verse 13, giving thanks to the Father who is able. When you give thanks to the Father, those of us, here's what Paul told the Colossians next. Here's what Paul told the Colossians next. He said, if you want to go higher, don't be fooled by other doctrines and backsliding. you got to learn how to be grateful and thank God because you understand why you're grateful. He actually has made us or qualified us to walk in his kingdom. How many know I was not qualified for the blessings that I'm getting? All I'm telling you is, you got to understand why I'm so thankful is because I realize who I am. And God loves me. When you get to the point that you wake up and know who it is that's keeping you, who it is that's blessing you, you are a thankful Christian. You'll never go higher until you can give thanks in all situations. A Hindu preacher once told a story. He said, I am the lowest incontemptible caste in our Hindu system. I'm on the lowest level of society. As a matter of fact, if someone from high society were to touch me, they would have to go to the Ganges River. That's a river, a Hindu river, where they have to wash off and go to purification because that's how dirty and low I'm considered. And yet, God decided to have me preach the gospel. And then he said, you know why God chooses people like me to preach? Because the Bible said, not many mighty are called. Know why God chooses messed up folk like us? Oh my God, I know why God chooses us. God chooses us because he knows when everything puts come to stuff and we get a blessing or a healing, people who know us, they won't, you know, lift us up because they know who we are. They don't think we're that much anyway. But they will give all the glory to God. And that's what people think. But the reason God chose us is he knows that I will give all the glory to him. I will make sure everyone knows who it is that got me this far. Paul said, if you become thankful and you give glory to God and you know why God chooses people, you will be blessed. Then it said, he delivered me from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Salvation. He gave me salvation. He, he, he brought me out of a place where my past wouldn't haunt me. My struggles wouldn't haunt me. The problems going on wouldn't haunt me. And he blessed me enough that um, I know now that I got the devil under my foot. I can say, get thee behind me, Satan, because he changed me when he saved me. What am I talking about? Longfellow the poet could get a piece of paper and write down a poem. It will be worth $60,000. That's called talent. Bill Gates can get a piece of paper and sign it, and it could be worth a million dollars. That's called capital, money. A seamstress can take $5 worth of material and turn it into a $50 profit. That's called skill. A businessman can take a 80 cent piece of merchandise, put it on the shelf and sell it for $5. That's called business. But God can take a no good, dirty, worthless sinner like me, clean me up, wash me, set me in his kingdom, Give me power over the devil and tell me I don't have to worry. That's called salvation. Jesus Christ blessed me 
with salvation, and anybody who will accept him can get saved. I'm closing on these last thoughts. You can go ahead and start playing. Watch this. Not only must we understand we have to walk worthy, not only must we understand we got to worship. Worshippers go higher. But the last point here is very simple. Verse 15 says, why can we go higher? Why do I feel I have the right to get out of this situation? Why do I sit here thinking whatever's going wrong, God can handle it? Why do I believe that there's more in God, there's better in God? Why do I believe my best is yet to come? Somebody said, you're getting older. I still believe my best is yet to come. How come this word is just filled me with that? Because I know who Jesus is. The reason I can go higher is not me. It's my Savior. Can somebody celebrate the Savior? It's not me. It's Jesus who paid the price, has his hands on me. The text says this. He is the firstborn. He's God's first option. He's, he has, he, he's the one who's in control of everything because he is first. So when God becomes your first option, you can go higher. Also, it says, I'm giving you a verse so you can follow me. Verse 16 tells us he owns everything. So if he owns everything, if I need healing, he owns it. If I need peace, he owns it. Come on, quit worrying. If I need deliverance, he owns it. Whatever I need, God owns it. And then the text tells us, watch this, finally, he is the head of the body. So he has, he owns everything. He's the head. We're the body. Don't lose me. So that means we, technically, I own it. That's why you can say peace is mine. Deliverance is mine. Joy is mine. Uh, getting out of this situation, I now have been translated into his kingdom. It's really mine. Come on, I'm talking to somebody. It's yours. Claim it. It's already yours. Because you're the body and he's the head. Do you realize that when these credit card companies send you, you know, you're pre, pre-approved. Uh, these credit cards say, you got a $5,000 limit. We haven't filled out a piece of paper. You're already pre-qualified. You know why they do that? Sometimes it's a scam to do extra interest. It's a, it's a joke. But when God qualified us, it was through the blood of Jesus Christ and His righteousness. So everything... I have I have a right to go higher because I'm pre-qualified for my deliverance. That's good somebody. You are pre-qualified. Thank you for listening today. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I know I got too excited. But I want somebody to leave here saying, I'm going higher. I don't have to stay at this level. I don't have to keep fighting these same battles, this same mess. I'm going higher in God. If you're not saved, pray this prayer with me. Lord God, come on, say this loudly. Say, Lord God, I am a sinner, but I'm coming to you because I believe you can save me. I confess it now. I believe it now. And say these words, I am saved. If you prayed that prayer and you believed it, then you can call us. You can call us or, or you can look up or go to our website. There's a contact number. You can text us. You can just email us and let us know. We'll send you some information. But just come on. I need you to hit me up in the chat room. Let me know these messages are doing you so good. And God will bless you for honoring Him. If you want to give to this ministry, I'm running out of time. Just quickly go to our website. And when you go to our website, there you will find information on how to give. And you can see all the activities you're giving to. This is Pastor Duncan saying, have a great day. God bless you. Talk it to him and leave it there. I was down but with no way up And I needed some help Everybody Breathing but not living Just existing Well, and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free.